Today is going to be a little bit different. This is going to be more of just a casual, unedited recording um, of some of our thoughts on what's going on at Asbury, the revival or awakening or outpouring or whichever word you prefer to describe this unique move of God that is going on at Asbury. Some of you may not even know what I'm talking about, and that's okay because we're going to get into what is happening um, over at Asbury. Um, so I think to start, I would just like to say a few words about leading up to this occurring. Um, my youth group that I work with here in Kentucky actually started the year off with a series about great moves of God throughout history. And so I was tasked, at, I think it was the last Sunday in January, uh, maybe second last, but end of January, to share about the 1970 Asbury Revival. So I spent about a week researching that and um, had a really great Sunday night where I got to talk with our students about what God did at Asbury and the 1970 Revival. And because of that, my mind um, was just very focused on this idea of God moving in a unique way. And I just felt led to be talking about um, this with people and praying about it. So I, I ran into an Asbury professor at the gym and we ended up talking about the need for revival and being praying for that for the students. Um, I got to talk with the Asbury University president, Kevin Brown, about how just a unique move of God is really the only thing that can impact um, Asbury to continue making it into uh, the institution um, that produces students of, of holiness and students that are truly chasing after God with all their heart. Um, and this is not just unique to me in the past few weeks. There's been an emphasis on and a history of revival at Asbury for years, and there have been people praying for this for years. In fact, in the past two years, my wife and I have noticed people moving to Wilmore that have specifically said, we just feel that God has called us to come to this town and pray um, for a move of God here. There was one man that for the past two years, he's been walking down one of our main streets with a sign, on uh, a cardboard sign that just says praying for revival and he'll just walk up and down and uh, be praying. So um, there's been a lot of prayer about this. There's been a lot of expectancy. Um, but to be honest, I can't say that I really thought or knew what this would look like until February 8th, uh, Wednesday, um, two Wednesdays ago, I was in class at the seminary and we were in a worship class and the professor got a text that something was going on at Asbury and that the students from the 10 a.m. chapel university, service, right? that's right, yeah, across the street at the university, the, uh, the students from a 10 a.m. worship service were, were still there and they were still worshiping. And so I immediately perked up because that's similar to what happened in, the in 1970. And... Uh, yeah, so that's when I first became aware that something unique was going on. How much longer did you say? I mean, how much after the fact did you guys get that word? So uh, my class was um, from 1 to 4, and the chapel service had started at 10 a.m. Mm -hmm. Ended um, at like 10.45 or 11. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so I got it. I was down here in Alabama, and I got a text from one of our youth students who, or former youth students, who's currently a, a Asbury student, and so he texted me about 3.30 um, and said, hey, we're having a little bit of revival going on. Chapel didn't end this morning. We're just <laughs> still in here, or to pray for us, you know, and so I started praying, and I was like, you know, what's going on? Is it just like praise and worship? And he's like, yeah, and prayer and confession, it's really great. So that was my like first uh, contact. And then I texted 
Paul and texted another student we have up there um, to see if they were aware or if they were a part of it. Um, yeah. The other student <laughs> that I reached out to hadn't been at chapel that morning because he wasn't feeling well. And so he was like, why does this, why, why, why would this happen? Well, I wasn't there. You know, uh, it's like, um, so I was like, well, I don't think that God's like trying to, you know, keep you out of his move. Um, <laughs> so just be praying for like your fellow students and be praying that God would be using, like we'd be moving. And then, uh, maybe he just yeah. didn't need his name to go down in history. Like the others <laughs> so I was trying to keep him humble. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Uh, um, so from what I've mag- heard, the magnificent 20 or whatever, <laughs> from what I've heard about what um, happened on this day is that, so if you don't know, Asbury has three mandatory chapel services every week that go from 10 to 1050. And so in this particular one, they did normal worship. Somebody got up to share a message. According to the guy that preached, he said it wasn't a particularly good message. He felt like he was tired and didn't communicate very clearly and didn't manage his time well. Um, so he ended up having to dismiss and just said, well, if you, um, you know, if you still feel like God ha- has something he wants to do in your life, I encourage you to stay around. Most of the students left like normal and went to their classes and work and lunch and all that. But I think about 20 to 30 students just remained in worship as a gospel choir got up to lead worship and they just felt prompted um, to stay. And then in the next couple hours, students from all over the campus just started slowly returning to Hughes for various reasons, Um, professors as well. And so when I got in there at four o'clock, it was actually, you know, certainly not full, but there were a decent amount of students in there worshiping. In the good old days before the lines and <laughs> wait lists, waiting lists and all that. <laughs> yeah, the different old days. One thing, though, that I oh, want to point out. Just, <laughs> good old days a week ago. <laughs> um, one thing I want to point out from my perspective that is just different. I know there are lots of accounts going on. Um, so I want to focus on some of the things that that have happened to us specifically. And one that I just have felt like is really cool and really orchestrated by God is that when I found out about this, I was in a worship class at the seminary, like I said, and we're actually talking about the transcendentals. So these are the values historically that we have, that society has said come from God and their beauty, goodness, and truth. We talked about this some with Christian Hemi way back in his episode. And we were talking in our class about how um, beauty was lost in the 1800s. People said it was in the eye of the beholder. It was subjective Um, truth, or sorry, goodness, um, similarly abandoned in the 19th century. And then truth in the 20th century has been abandoned, where we have this language of your truth, my truth, And so we were talking about in class how we need to reclaim, there needs to be a reclaiming of these transcendentals and how we need to, the professor's feeling is that instead of arguing about what is true, which is what we tend to do um, today, we need to focus on the beauty and the goodness of God and then allow him to restore his truth through that. And so when I got over to uh, Hughes Auditorium at the university, there's just an immediate sense of the presence of God like I've never experienced before as I walked in. And the defining characteristics, I would say, are just um, peace, gentleness, goodness, and, and beauty. And so I think in many ways through this unique outpouring that God is doing at Asbury, he is reestablishing, especially in the hearts of the younger generation, that he is good and he is beautiful and he is trustworthy. Um, 
So that's one of the things that I'm seeing in this and, and one of the things I've been praying will spread across the nation um, as we continue to just ask and pray that this spreads across the country and also across the world. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and Paul so shared that with me because... For base, uh, based on the... Okay, well, I don't know. Maybe this is irrelevant. Based, but... Just from everything that you've said so far, there were two things that I really wanted to ask about, which one is the sign guy, um, <laughs> if he's been involved or if anyone's talked to him. Um, <laughs> yeah, so the sign guy was actually in Hong Kong when this came about on Wednesday, February 8th. Why? And so he actually, he that's where he's from. Okay. Okay. And so he actually, I think, flew back like possibly the next day um, wow. to to be a part of this. And he's been posting in the seminary Facebook group every day about it. Cool. <clears throat> uh, my other question was your conversation with the university president mm. talking about the necessity of a revival mm-hmm. or revival-like act of God. Mm-hmm. Um in order to, I think you said, allow the university to continue to function as it does or did or something like that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, I was a little, yeah, I was interested. Just, in what, yeah, continue what that to means. thrive, I guess. Basically, what I how that conversation came up is I was asking him, how do you manage just the need to attract students? to be able to function as an institution, you know, you have to have a certain number of students that are coming and paying the bills just from a business perspective. So how do you, how do you balance just the need for students with also the desire to bring in students of character and quality that will maintain the culture that Asbury is known for? Um, And of course, Students also come to Asbury that don't have a relationship with God. And often they are greatly impacted by the culture and they get saved. But it's at a certain point, if you have more students that are not deeply following the Lord, then you're going to lose that culture. So that's basically what we were talking about. And he shared some actually just incredible wisdom as far as some some natural um or institutional ways that they do that. Um, But where the conversation ended was that ultimately we need God to step in and do a reviving work in the hearts of this generation. So that context was not necessarily that things it's getting worse around here and the, the quality of students, just that it's not what it used to be here or something like that. Not that as much as that our culture is perhaps maybe worse is not a great word, but our culture is getting more secular. And so the pool of students that have grown up in thriving churches and youth groups, I would say, are becoming less and less. And so that presents a challenge. One thing I heard one of the interviews I listened to on YouTube, they were talking to students and just used the phrase like... um, for your for the Gen Z, it's not cool to be Christian. It's not cool to believe in God, and that's probably the case more than it has been in the past. Where it's like, mm-hmm. it's probably cooler to say you're not a Christian or you don't believe in God. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't think necessarily the the generation before uh, had any particular. Uh, social benefits of, of claiming to be Christian either, but mm-hmm. I mean, it's probably just increasing more with each subsequent generation. Yeah. And I would for say my, for my ahead, experience, yeah. I would say that um, for like millennials, it was more like more marginal and edgy kind of. And then um, for Gen Z, it's more like a little bit more like mainstream, I guess. I wonder if that's a regional thing or if that's just the, or I just haven't noticed. Um, well, I would, well, let's move on to 
talking yeah, about yeah. what both, both of those questions probably aren't really like going to make the cut but <laughs> no those are good and we're not editing this so okay. don't make the cut <laughs> oh. oh sorry i mean i gotta be more careful with my <laughs> comments then <laughs> this is this is a raw unedited episode a, a special episode um okay so then after wednesday just touching on what's happened since because it's been Okay, so it's February 18th now, so we're 10, we're going on the 11th day, is that right? Um, so this has been quite a while that this has been going on. So, so I was there Wednesday evening, that first day, February 8th, for about four hours, and really just enjoying being in that worshipful environment. We left about midnight and there were still people there worshiping i came back fairly early on thursday and there were still people there worshiping they had gone all night and uh, did you have a sense that they would go all night when you left on midnight at midnight on wednesday i thought they would but i didn't know for sure um because and this is something i'll get into but really there's nothing unique going on on stage it's what you would see at a normal church service. There's, you know, singing, music, uh, prayer, people sharing, confession, testimonies. Um, but like I said, dancing, <laughs> the uh, running down the aisles, <laughs> yeah, swinging from the chandeliers, <laughs> all the normal things. No, <laughs> there's not much of that going on. Um, but like I said, there's just an awareness of the presence of God. And so I thought it would go all night, but I was also very aware that the moment that God finishes whatever he's doing in allowing himself to be present in this unique way, people are going to leave. There's there's nothing, there's no reason to stay there other than the fact that people are having an encounter with God. Um, so I had a friend that stayed there all night, um, that first night. Um, I have another friend who just felt like God wanted to do something in his life. And so, um, he stayed in, until about 2 30 AM until he had a very dramatic encounter with the Holy spirit. Um, so even from the very first day, God was really moving in people's lives. And then, so we get into Thursday and, very similar, continues throughout the whole day. More people start coming from the immediate area uh, just to witness what God is doing. Like city, the, the townspeople, you mean? Yeah, mostly town people. And then some people from Lexington that are maybe like involved in like prayer houses or just have a unique call to be, you know, they've been praying for revival. Or um, alumni. Or alumni, right. People that are somehow connected with the university. And so Thursday night, it was it was actually pretty full. Um, but just an amazing time of worship. Um, just, uh, like I said, presence of God like I've never experienced. Outpouring of the Holy Spirit of just joy, peace. Amazing sense of love and unity for everyone in the room. Um, really... A taste of heaven, I would say, where you just don't want to leave. You want to continue to praise and glorify God with all that you are. And you want to love the people around you in any way possible. So for me, that started looking like I would just have the desire to go pray for somebody in the room. And so I would go and we would talk and we would pray and it and God would move. And it's like it it wasn't about me. It wasn't about the other person. It wasn't about the people on stage. It was just God working in that space and in a really unique way. And then as we went into the weekend, Friday and Saturday is when more and more people started to come. And so... Crazy. Uh, wait, before that, when, when, you, uh, when you say you ha would have a desire to pray for people, do you mean just like whoever's nearby or you would have a specific person that you're like, I want to pray for that person. I'm going to go see if they'll let me. Um, for me, it's been more specific. Um, so 
like I would see, so there was one time like I saw somebody I knew from a class at seminary a couple of semesters back and just felt like, I wonder if I should go pray for him. And then, but this particular time I was trying to get home to do some stuff at the house. So I was like, yeah, I need to get home. So I start walking out and then a testimony starts. So I said, well, I'll listen to this testimony. And the person started sharing about how they had experienced freedom from anxiety and depression um, since they had been there. And so they said, if anybody's struggling with those things, we want you to stand up and we're going to have people pray for you. And, and people stood up. And this particular guy I knew stood up and nobody went over to pray for him. And so I just said, okay, God, I'll, I'll go pray for him instead of leaving. Um, so stuff, stuff like that. And then also like less dramatic, just like, I think I should pray for the person sitting next to me. Um, there's, there's been that as well. The way that it gained steam was so interesting, has been so interesting. Hmm. Just the like, you know, Wednesday we were hearing about it. And then Thursday, the fact that when it was keep going, kept going and like people were kind of coming around from the immediate area. Right. Olivia was like, should we go up and like be a part of this? And I, I was like, I have to preach on Sunday. <laughs> uh, so I don't think I can just hand that off to somebody and go. <laughs> Um, yeah, especially because it's like a nine, 10 hour drive for you. Right. right. Mm -hmm. So we were talking about it and, um, I don't remember if it was Thursday or Friday basically said, well, if it's still going on Sunday, we'll, we'll go up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, cause mm -hmm. actually both of the students and I don't remember Paul, if you said this as well, but I know that the students that we have up there said you, like you guys should come up or something like that. <laughs> like we would love to have you guys up here. Or mm -hmm. something like that. So they were like kind of asking us to come. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and people kept asking Riley and I, how long do you think this will go? <laughs> and we're like, we have no idea. The Like I was saying before, the moment that it was totally God was leading it. And it was very obvious that no person was leading this thing. And so we just kept telling people, you know, come as soon as you can because... Whenever God finishes w whatever it is he's doing here, then it's done. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So when we even even when we were getting ready to leave and, and on Saturday is when we decided we were going to go um, for sure and yeah. reached out to some of our students because, you know, uh, Olivia w was like, we should reach out to some of our students and see if they want to come because some of them had already kind of talked to us about it. We have a few students that are going to be uh, starting up there at Asbury in the fall. So they especially were the first ones to reach out to us. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And then, <clears throat> so we started by reaching out to our juniors and seniors and uh, seeing if any of them could like go, even though it was the very next day. And so then we like reached out to some of our 10th graders and just kind of moved down, ended up taking like 10 students up. Um, and how long uh, were you, were you t saying you were going to be taking them? We said we were going to leave Sunday and come back Wednesday. Yep. And, you know, it was definitely the thought, like, I was a little bit nervous when we first were reaching out to other students, because I'm thinking, okay, if, if like, me and me and Olivia and mom and dad go up, and it stops on Monday, like, no big deal. We're still up in mm -hmm. Wilmore, where we went to school, and we've got family up there, and we love being up there anyway, and so it'll be a nice time in Wilmore. Mm -hmm. And we've got students up there. But if we take all these students, and then it stops, like, what are we going to do with them, <laughs> you know? <laughs> um, right. <laughs> so I was a little bit yeah, was... that that thought occurred to me when I heard that mom and dad were bringing like some staff from the church and stuff. Yeah, and I was like, oh, mm -hmm. all right. Well, I hope hope it keeps going. <laughs> yeah, but I just had the thought like, if you know, it's worth it's worth it to like let these students be a part of something like this for the potential. You know, mm -hmm. um, right. if right. you know, if God stops, you know, if it stops, then we'll figure something out. Um, but. If it doesn't, then these students are going to be a part of something that has the potential to really shape their entire lives of having mm -hmm. an encounter with the Lord that can really mark them. I mean, I've heard people talk about the 70s revival and the 50s revival yeah. who are old people now, and they still talk about what an impact it made on their entire lives and the way that they understand like mm -hmm. God and seeking God. And um, so it mm -hmm. has that sort of potential, especially for these high school students. So That's right. 
so to jump ahead, do you think do, do you think that was borne out in some of those students? I think it will be. I, I definitely think so. I think. Um, well, there's like immediate testimony for some of them what they feel like God did like while they were there, and so some of them shared that this past Wednesday when we got back to youth group. Um, but I think for most of them, there's that lasting impact of being a part of God and moving in a powerful way that just like gives you a confidence of his, that he's real and that he can move. Like that's one thing I've seen. It's same, same that I've seen in people who were a part of the past revivals is they just have this confidence that like God can move in a powerful way. And so mm-hmm. there's like, a, I don't know, it's like helps with doubts or helps with discouragement when things seem like they're mm-hmm. becoming dark or whatever. Yeah. Also, we've seen a lot of answered prayers, too. That's been one of the ways that I think my faith has really, well, that I've been changed, is I have an increased confidence that God hears my prayers, because I've just seen him answering a lot of them this past week. And and I think, too, like just an increased confidence that even when I don't see them answered quickly, that he still hears them. Um, because we were praying for revival for years and years, and I didn't even know what I was praying for really, but here it is. Like God has heard us and God is faithful. Yeah. I definitely had that thought several times of like, okay, like all of these prayers that have been prayed for the last 40 years, even specifically about Asbury and God to move at Asbury, like they've been answered. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, for some people, that's like when I was a student 10 years ago, that's a decade, you know, for other people, it's been three decades, mm-hmm. you know, since they started praying or were praying, but mm-hmm. it's still like it's happened, you know? Yeah. So at this point, um, I feel like there's three different directions we can take this. Do we want to continue the timeline and kind of cover the rest of the facts and then get back to the other kind of questions and, and yeah. speculations? Yeah, let's do that. Um, So really, one of the interesting things about this whole thing is you have this spiritual component that we've been getting into a little bit, but then you have just the logistics and what's actually happening on the ground, and both are very interesting. Um, Daniel, you have a question? Uh, Yeah, the logistics actually is something I did want to ask about because you said... Well, I guess I could – anyway, because you, you mentioned how no one's leading this, right, and like mm-hmm. God is totally directing this. Mm-hmm. But I have heard things since about you know how they're managing alternating worship teams and things like that. Eventually that yeah. – some uh, amount mm-hmm. of mm-hmm. human organization had to be implemented. That's so right. How soon do you think that started taking place? Yeah, yeah. Um, So to some extent immediately, but I would call it more like a stewardship than leading. Um, And so essentially you have like probably about five people on, on staff at Asbury university that have just recognized um, this is a unique move of God. And so they've been continually praying about how do we steward this? Well, Um, how do we keep things organized you know, orderly, how do we keep our students safe and healthy? And yet, how do we let God continue to do this work that he wants to do and just let him use our space and be a part of it? Um, So it's really been amazing to see the leadership at Asbury. I'm, yeah, just amazed at how well they've led this or organized this. So, yeah, let's talk about some of just the logistics of what's been happening. So Saturday was the first night I went that the auditorium was just packed, the fullest I've ever seen it. Basically, there wasn't even all the standing room between the aisles filled up. All the seats were full. Um, The lobby started to fill. Uh, It was wild. And so after that night the fire department came in and started saying, hey, we're going to shut you guys down if you don't keep the aisles clear. 
Um, and so they were like, okay, I guess we'll have to do something else. And so then what they moved to is just having a line to get in at the front of the building and they wouldn't let anybody come in unless there was an open seat. So by Sunday, it had changed to only people in seats, you know, really trying to keep people out of the rows. Um, I think that was Sunday night that that sort How of started to change. was it maxed out like that? Was that like about one or two hours or was it like the entire day it was like that? It was Saturday evening service. So they've been doing like more like structured services in the evening. Okay. Um, in the midst of the whole thing. Right, right. Um, and what that has looked like is typically like have some students come up and share testimony, have somebody get up and present the gospel, and then have a time of worship, but also like a call to response. So that Saturday night they had, you know, first just a clear gospel presentation and had people stand up if they wanted to accept Jesus for the first time. And only a few people stood up um, because it's it's mostly been people coming that are Christians, but they're just desperate yeah. to go deeper. And, and so, to see God move. And to see God move, Yes. So then after that, they gave a call to stand up for full surrender to God and the, you know, this pursuit of whole, the holy life and a bunch, probably a hundred, mostly students stood up. Um, so that was Saturday night. Then Sunday night is when um, it was again packed out. They started keep trying to keep people out of the rows. And they opened up two overflow sites across the street at the seminary, two other chapels that were live streaming the service. Um, and so that's when Joel and um, mom and dad and the people from Harvest came up late that night. And when we got there, it was we got there at like 1 o'clock a.m. So it was not crowded. So we were able to go into Hughes and there was probably 40 mm -hmm. people in there or something like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. maybe more but it was you know it wasn't like we were having trouble getting in we were able to roll right in and um start like worshiping and praying and then went to bed after an hour and a half or something mm -hmm. and, and it was pretty uh like subdued at that at that time yeah it was very like i mean there were people walking um in the aisles praying and just worshiping and very um like not not high energy at all just uh like um, mm -hmm. but not like sleepy, <laughs> you know, not sleepy either. And, it uh, definitely just felt like, um, you know, I, I didn't, I was telling, um, one of my friends who went to Asbury, like I've always felt like a holiness and presence of God in Hughes, Like even when nobody's there and I like have walked in, I've always felt that. And so I felt like the, I wasn't like surprised at like the presence of God. Cause I feel like that's something I'm familiar with in that area. Um, but like the fact that worship had been going on, like there was, there's something, um, we we're entering into like a continued move of God that you can feel like that God has been working and I'm like stepping into it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What about, we'll take a break from the logistical side since we're kind of hitting on some of the spiritual, what about some of the other people you were with? There, yeah, so like some of them feelings? definitely felt like there was more, uh, like immediate, um, encounter with the Lord or like awareness of his presence. Like some mm -hmm. of them did and some of them didn't, you know, some of them said, I didn't really feel super special. I just felt like a worship service was going on and it was like nice, very nice. Like, um, my, and now Olivia, my wife, she said like, as soon as she walked in, she had that, like a, like a thrill and like an expectation. Um, and she said like, it reminded her of like our wedding day when like the doors open and she's like about to walk down the aisle. Mm -hmm. Um, that was like her, uh, comparison. So that like, I'm about to go meet with God kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, so it was like a mix, but I, and Paul earlier talked about goodness and beauty. The word that I kept using was beauty. Um, mm -hmm. and, I, before, and then he shared that with me after, cause he was like, Oh wow, that's cool that you use that word because our professor was just talking about this. Yeah. Um, but that's what I just kept using. It's like, this is just beautiful. It's beautiful to see people desiring to worship and it's beautiful mm -hmm. to see people want to tarry and like linger in the presence of God. And, um, 
this like sense of humility and and hunger and love mm-hmm. that was like really just like evident. Even mm-hmm. and that was even before I went. That was even coming through all the social media posts and testimonies. Mm-hmm. Like I shared a, at the sermon on Sunday. Like I've never been so grateful for social media as I have been in this past week because I've been able to be impacted by what God's doing but from 600 miles away and it's been like revitalizing my spirit and encouraging me. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've definitely had some of it. Like I feel like not necessarily our entire church or anything, but at least our home there's more of a, I mean, we're just more likely to be having worship music going, be streaming like, Oh, someone's like streaming the, so let's just have it. And we're just like worshiping along in the middle of our day to, you know, night or mm-hmm. whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, and just like reading these super encouraging accounts. And it's just like, yeah, I'm not nec- uh, like, um, you can put it in very, mundane like physical terms and it's just but it's it's yeah. orienting your mind it's like another it's just helping you to like have more of a focus mm-hmm. on the goodness of god and like the ways he can move and the things he can do and there's definitely a part of us that's like uh oh, you know it'd be so cool to experience that or to have that happen here or something but even with just seeing the information from afar it's it has a positive effect mm-hmm. on us mm-hmm. And yeah. I sensed that stirring in Dothan before we left that like what was going on was really causing a stirring and a hunger and a desire in the people here. Mm-hmm. And um, so then w- on Monday, some people from our church were like, we should open up the worship center at Harvest and see if people want to come like just pray and worship. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I was up at Asbury and I was like, yes, like do that. There's such a, I can tell that people are hungry and they just want to worship. And so... Mm-hmm. They did that. They've been so here at Harvest. They've been doing that past like all week, Monday through Friday, and people have been coming. Yeah, like nights of worship, basically. Basically, but it's just yeah, just like um, you know, at first on Monday, and I don't know if sometimes throughout they've just been putting on music on mm-hmm. like Spotify, and so mm-hmm. they're just like play worship music. But then if somebody comes, like on Monday, some people came who led worship, and so they uh, jumped up on stage and started leading. Mm-hmm. And so it's been like mostly in person, but sometimes if nobody's there to lead, mm-hmm. then they just turn on music. And people are just praying and stuff. Yeah. And they've got a mic up front for anybody to share if they want to share a testimony or, or a scripture or just something God's put on their heart. And so that's going on as well. Yeah. It's really cool to see it impacting so many different spheres. I certainly felt that at our church here when I went, that it was just a really powerful service, uniquely powerful. And I think it was uniquely powerful. Um, I was trying to kind of discern, is this, is the service different or am I different? And I think it's both. Um, yeah. <laughs> one of the things we've been talking about a lot, the, the one of the speakers that's been here for this is he's saying, um, you know, like the goal of revival is for all of us to be desiring God more and more and for us to be on fire for God and leave this place on fire for God. Um, so I've certainly seen that. The other cool thing is I've heard stories of just people talking about God and what he's doing and curiosity in the workplace. So I have a friend that's been working here since, um, August and he's in a very secular work environment. And so one of the first nights we just prayed over his workspace and I think it was the next day or a few days, it was a few days later, um, he had somebody come in and say, have you heard about all those Christians that are running to Asbury? Kind of mocking. And he said, mm-hmm. yeah, I've been there a lot. And she was like, oh, and kind of laughed. And he said it resulted in basically the whole office the whole staff came into his office and were asking him about his faith. And well, so not, not specifically about the event, but more about like what he believes. That's right. That's right. And so there's certainly, we're seeing what you guys are sharing that God is using this to just spark stuff in a lot of different places. Um, so continuing with just the logistics of uh, more of just what's been happening. So 
So since that was Sunday night that we talked about when Joel got up here, then really just every day it's been more and more people. Um, it's really interesting to see. Um, you know, we're a very small town, if you don't know. Wilmore is a two stoplight, one gas station town. And <laughs> it's been the most crowded I've ever seen it where we actually have traffic now. And when I went to class on Wednesday, I had a hard time finding a parking spot. And when I was leaving, you know, people, random people kept asking me where the revival service was. Um, and so then Thursday comes and it's just storming. And I think, oh, okay, this is finally going to be a little bit of a break in the crowds. Nope, huge line all day, people just standing out in the rain, waiting to get in. Then Friday, which is yesterday, Friday comes, and uh, it was the first time I had seen a line for even the overflow chapel across the street. There was a decent-sized yeah. line to get into that. The line for Hughes, people were waiting for about four hours. Um, and now we're at Saturday, and... As of 8.30 this morning when my wife was on the way to work, there was a very sizable line and it doesn't open till 1 p.m. So there's an extreme hunger and, you know, there's also a lot of negativity about and criticism about all these people coming. But the way I've been describing it is, in my perspective, it looks a lot like when Jesus was ministering on earth. You had these huge crowds coming with all different kinds of agendas and motives. You had people that were there to mock him. You had people that were there to try to trap him. Trick him. And, yeah, yeah, trick him. Right. Trap. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then you had people that were really desiring an encounter with Jesus. And I think that's what we're seeing. And in, from my perspective, the large majority are purely desiring um, to experience mm -hmm. God. And so... So it's been crazy here in our little town, but I praise God for it because he's doing an amazing work. So with those huge lines, I guess what I'm wondering is, is it because people feel like, you know, if I can just touch the the carpet of the auditorium, mm -hmm. yeah, the, you know, if I can just like get in there, then I'm going to have an encounter with God? Or like, uh, why can't they have enough overflow i guess it just grew too fast for them to have prepared enough places mm -hmm. or well, is it that they don't want to open too many places because they don't want to like have this you know there's only so many people who can be present at these different locations well there are a lot of people that just want to get into hughes, uh, hughes. the yeah. main um, one this yeah. is where it happened Mm -hmm. is, yeah, because mm -hmm. the they have yeah, opened yeah. a lot of overflow and this has just been amazing to see the ecumenical aspect of this the united methodist church down the street shares a space with a vineyard church and they open their space to live stream then the baptist church across from them opened their space to live stream this non-denominational universities worship service mm -hmm. um so that's been really cool to see the body of christ mm -hmm. unified in this but to answer your question yeah. daniel have, have those been pretty well attended those church overflows um i mean fewer people would know about it i'm sure yeah i mean last i heard those spaces were pretty full as well now i don't think they're having to turn people away and having lines uh, but they've certainly yeah. been full but yeah, a lot of people, especially if they've traveled from far, they're just saying, hey, I'm I'm going to wait for four hours just to see and be able to sit for a bit in, uh, in where it started. Yeah. And then on Tuesday night, they had they put out a screen out in front of Hughes mm -hmm. in like the That's uh, right. space. Yeah. And so people who are okay. waiting. So can, people can experience and wait. Right. People can worship and um, also like wait at the same time. So that you know, helps for people who want to wait. They're like, well, I can also, I can wait while I'm also worshiping and being aware of what's going on. Mm -hmm. And so now what we're starting to see and what we're really praying for is that it's spreading to other places. So I've seen people reports. have to necessarily go right there. That's right. Yeah. The whole world can't fit into Hughes Auditorium. That's why <laughs> Jesus established <laughs> the, the church. <laughs> um, this amazing movement where you have 
places all over wherever you live, communities of faith. And so uh, I know that Lee University down in Tennessee has been having worship services since Monday. Um, I just saw a report about Cedarville in Ohio and also Samford in Birmingham, Alabama. So it is spreading and we're continuing to pray that it'll spread more. And like Joel said, churches, you know, Harvest, other churches, and uh, I think some high schools as well. Mm. So um, go ahead, Joel. A couple, couple thoughts that uh, there's a lot to get, try to get to there. Um, we haven't really talked about the social media component, which is really what made this blow up in a way that nobody really uh, like saw happening. Because True. like I, I, when they were there, they said something about like viral doesn't equal revival, right? <laughs> um, and so... It was people sharing on social media that really made this explode. Yeah. And that's a unique, you know, um, and that's one of the reasons people have come from all over the place. So the fact mm-hmm. that social media has made it so, so, um, social media has made it such a public event. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so quickly. So quickly. Yeah. Which is just amazing. I mean, you know, I, I don't remember if it was because of this or some other event. I think it was this. It reminded me of the Bible. Uh, when Jesus comes back and talks about every eye will see him, mm-hmm. I'm like, mm-hmm. you can totally see how that's doable these days where something amazing happens. And then within a day, everybody knows about it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but then, so then I was thinking about, Paul, you talked about the uh, masses of people in Wilmore. So the mm-hmm. population of Wilmore is 6,000. Um, <laughs> that's the population of the city. That's crazy. And they that's estimated, like, yeah. they estimated Wednesday night that there were 5,000 people visiting for their revival. So that's like almost <laughs> yeah. double the population of the city is there. Um, so, so that you can, obviously, like you can have, imagine how finding parking spaces has been recently. <laughs> yeah, like imagine if whatever city you live in just doubled population because of people coming. Yeah, from. I want to know where where these out of town people are parking. Yeah, uh, yeah it's crazy. All the streets <laughs> in yeah. the neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> oh, like even over to where you live. It hasn't quite gotten all the way to our street, thankfully, quite yet, but pretty much all the way up to acres? our street is just like lined with cars. Wow. Yeah. yeah, acres. acres? Yeah, the Joneses, our, our aunt and uncle, they've, um, they're, 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 their <laughs> parking spots have been taken. <laughs> <laughs> so like they get home from work and have nowhere to be? Yeah, I think they're having to be a little more strategic with their driveway these days. <laughs> that's probably they need to learn that probably <laughs> it's a good yeah. so yeah it's a good skill to have so that's that's really cool um and you know they've had to to accommodate the crowds they've like brought in bathroom trailers mm-hmm. and um some food trucks and stuff like that because wilmore has a total of like four restaurants is that right oh yeah <laughs> Yeah, four restaurants. So Let's see. the Chinese, the the Chinese yeah. Subway, yeah. a pizza place they usually have, and a Mexican place. Mexican place, no more. So just pizza Chinese. and Solomon's. Yeah, pizza. Oh, Solomon's. Yeah, right. yeah. Okay, so and then obviously and then, and then like, on campus the school. Yeah. Uh huh. So there's five restaurants, wow. which five restaurants for five thousand additional people is um, uh, one thousand people per restaurant. <laughs> um. <laughs> So that is crazy. Yeah, it's ridiculous. Mm-hmm. Um, so the other thing that it makes me think of is, you know, you hear people talking about in church, you know, uh, you know, people get so excited for the Super Bowl and they'll scream and they'll do all this for, you know, sports. Mm-hmm. And we need to be doing that for Jesus. And it's like, hey, that's yeah, happening. Why isn't anybody painting themselves for Jesus? Yeah. <laughs> and so it's like, well, obviously that happens, right? We, we do have mm. the passion for Jesus yeah. to the extent of these people have passion for these other things. Um, yeah. You know, people are waiting in lines longer than they do for Disney World rides mm-hmm. and to get into Disney. And mm-hmm. so that's really encouraging to see that sort of um, excitement. And, and it does kind of show that the heart of the church is not bent toward the world more than bent toward God, you know? That's right. Um, um, that's a great insight. So that's been really encouraging to me, um, mm-hmm. just like how hungry people are and yeah. how how much people desire God to move and to be a part yeah. of it. And people are tired of the production, heavy, shallow worship services, I think. So when there's a real, genuine, deep place to worship, they're really desperate for that. 
to come into a community that's not about production, not about any particular speaker or worship leader. It's just about worshiping God in community. A huge aspect is doing it with the family of God. And so I've talked to many people that have just felt like they've experienced a lot of healing just by being in an environment where so many people are seeking God with them. Mm-hmm. So we're getting more into the spiritual side, which is where I'd like to go and, and wrap this conversation up um, as well, is just talking about some of the more spiritual implications of this. And so I want to hear your guys' thoughts, but I, I did want to share that my some of my overall impressions of what I feel like and pray that God is doing in this outpouring is, like I said before, restoring a sense of God's goodness and his beauty, but also just um, pouring out peace and emotional healing on the younger generation. So the most common testimony, and there's been tons of testimonies of God working, but the most common ones I've heard is young people saying that they've been freed from depression, from suicidal thoughts, from anxiety, from fear. And uh, I think that that is going to be a work that God is wanting to pour out on Gen Z across the nation, is a healing of those things and um, an awareness of his peace, his joy, and his goodness. Hmm. So that's that's one of the things I think he's doing. But like I said, there's a lot and love to hear your thoughts as well. I think the way that God's like just moving across the country, mm. um, the maybe because I'm not up at Asbury all the time, I've been aware of people all, all over the place talking about like what God's doing and this like anticipation that God's moving. Mm. Um and so for me, like yesterday, I think it was yesterday, just like driving around, it was like, I just felt like the Holy Spirit was everywhere. Wow. Like, yeah. obviously that's always the case, but just like this awareness of like, <laughs> like this awareness that like, oh, like I feel like the Holy Spirit is just moving like all around me right now. And like, mm. I, I'm aware that he's like moving through our city and like doing stuff. Yeah. And, um, I don't know if, again, I don't know if that's just me or if that's like a broader, broader awareness or Mm -hmm. heightened awareness of, of God's move. But I feel like that is something that I don't think it's just, uh, just me. Um, yeah. So that's cool. Then like when I shared, I got to share yesterday, no Thursday with, um, a small group at, at a high school here in town. And then, um, some homeschoolers at Harvest who are part of a homeschool co-op about what's been going on. And for both of them, I was saying, um, you know, God's moving and there's a hunger in the Christians of this world. People are hungry for God. Yeah. And so if you're not hungry for God, like you should examine yourself and ask God to give you hunger. Mm -hmm. Um, and you should be ready for Jesus to come back because like this could be like the Lord starting a revival, like it's bringing, like preparing the church for his return. Hmm. Um, so that's one thing that I've been, you know, uh, obviously like you don't know, but mm-hmm. like, I'm, I'm like, how cool would it be if Asbury is the place that like kind of sparked the revival that leads to the second coming? Um, that'd be awesome for us because we all went there. <laughs> so, uh, we have a lot of ties. <laughs> we have a lot of ties at Asbury anyway, but yeah, it's good. What, what about you, Daniel? Um, I definitely agree with both of you, um, especially the thing about Gen Z, you know, or the, you know, the young, young folks today. Um, <laughs> and especially that whole thing about like anxiety and whatnot, like, um, from an older person's perspective, often, you know, looking at Instagram or whatever, I'm often rolling my eyes at these younger like relatives of mine and stuff who seem to have this um social almost like a pressure to be negative and to be depressed i guess Mm. like uh, 
super trivial example, like all uh, the students I teach who are like 12 and 14, basically a hundred percent of them would say they have tryptophobia, you know, where you don't like lots of holes and something. Um, and it's very obvious to me that it's like, okay, this is like what you're supposed to have. It's kind of like that phenomenon of, mm. of not liking the word moist that was going on like 10 years ago or whatever. Um, it's that kind of thing. And I think for a lot of Gen Z, the self-loathing, I guess, and kind of like depression, all that stuff. I'm not like, not to just minim- like uh, trivialize it, but mm-hmm. it, because it's it's baked in like to the culture that they're living through. And I do think a lot of it's legitimate. But so for them getting freed from that, I think is hugely significant. Um, and also like what Joel's talking about, the the kind of awakening or like revelation of of how many Christians throughout the country and I hope we'll see world too. I, I feel like so far I haven't you know, I've mostly just been seeing Americans talk about this, but um how this has kind of been galvanizing or like stirring them to take action. I think especially some of the clips I've seen where like secular news outlets, uh, local and national have covered the event and generally in like, I'm kind of surprised that they even bother almost, but they're always been from what I've seen pretty much positive about it. And I think it's really mm-hmm. encouraging people who have felt like, you know, we're just in this dark world and the church is losing ground and not many people are believing and blah, 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 blah. I think it's encouraging them to feel like, you know, hey, God's doing stuff and stuff can still happen and and we don't have to be, like, worried about, we like, our church is a little fortress that's <laughs> losing ground day by day. We can, we can be pursuing this kind of awesome mm. experience too. Mm-hmm. Um and then the other thing that really has stuck out, and again, like I'm the only one of us who hasn't actually been anywhere. I mean, like I've just been, you know, here the whole time. I haven't experienced anything firsthand. It's all second or third hand accounts. Um, but another thing that has stood out to me a lot about this is the um, commitment to humility. Mm hmm and almost anonymity yeah like people not you know there people aren't putting their names out there people aren't really like there's no face yeah. to this movement mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. and i think that you know, hearing about the people who have been praying behind the scenes and are staying behind the scenes like they're just taking part they're rejoicing even like some of these um more like well-known within christian circles people mm-hmm. um well-known Christian people um, attending or covering or being part of it, but in no case have any of them become like a big focus for it. And not that there's anything wrong with those people, but just that the fact that it's very much, um, no one is really trying to, well, yeah, I don't think anyone's really trying to or take like stealing any of the glory from God or, Yeah, or no one's interested in giving any of that glory to anyone else. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. Apparently, the night one of the nights we were there, Louis Giglio was there, sitting near us, actually, like up in the balcony, and like no clue, you know, I didn't know he was there. Uh, this like <laughs> large, you know, like large, uh, popular Christian leader, um, and so <laughs> it's just the same. <laughs> he's not large; he's normal sized. <laughs> um, what is he known for? Is he an author or just a large church pastor? Uh, I just know him as a preacher. Yeah. <laughs> just a huge <laughs> hulking. But yeah, I, I wanted to touch on the humility aspect as well. Um, because that's been a real strong theme throughout the whole thing, even before started people started coming in. In fact, even the chapel service before anything really started, the speaker was talking about, you know, I don't want you to remember me, I just want you to remember God's words and then one of the things he's been saying throughout it is that the kindling for revival is radical humility. And so that's been a real call. So he was talking about revival in his message? No. Okay, that came after. Yeah, that came after. Mm-hmm. 
Okay. So that's been a real call throughout this whole thing is to surrender your pride, to seek God for, for radical humility. And it's been really characterized in the leadership at Asbury um, where they'll get up and they don't even say who they are necessarily, their full names. They'll just say, hey, I'm Kevin or hey, I'm Jeannie, you know, I'm Greg, that kind of thing. I work here at Asbury. Just very humble, um, not about them at all. And they've said very often too, like, there's no rock stars in this building. There's nothing special about us. It's all about Jesus. We're here for Jesus and to glorify God. Um, and that's been consistent throughout this whole thing. Like I said, when it was mostly students and now as it's been more and more people from all over the country. And uh, they've also just politely turned down a lot of publicity. Um, Fox News wanted to come do a national story and they just politely asked them if they wouldn't come in person. Um, I've heard big name worship leaders have offered to come in and lead worship and they've said, no, we just kind of want to keep this student led with our people um, that just continue to let God do what he's doing. Um, like Joel said, big name speakers. And so um, humility has been a huge takeaway for me in just the importance of that in my own personal ministry and, you know, how can I live my life more and more in a way that everything I do is not about me, but about God? And then finally, I think the aspect of unity is huge in how we're, we've already been touching on this, how we've been seeing, seeing it unify uh, the church. Um, there, you know, there's also a lot of people being skeptical and negative and, um, everybody seems to have their way that they think revival has to happen, which is so funny to see. It's like literally could not be more like the Pharisees in the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, the well, and that's kind of, well, go ahead, go ahead. Um, but I do think the unity that I've seen at least is amazing in the people that are coming um, in person, but like Joel and Daniel were sharing too, just the, the church around the nation. Um, and so we'll, yeah, just continue to pray that that bears fruit. Uh, one more thought on just explaining what this looks like for people that aren't, have never experienced anything like this, like me 14 days ago or whatever, um, is that for me, it's helpful to know that the way that I've seen this is, um, so there's a Jonathan Edwards quote that says revival is the, su is the surprising act of God. And I think the better way to phrase that, that my professor used on Wednesday is God acting in a surprising way. Um, and another professor, Dr. Steve Siemens, has said that revival is the accelerated work of the Holy Spirit. And so it's, it's the normal ways that the Holy Spirit works in all of our lives and in the church. You know, what we're doing and what's been happening here is music and worship. It's prayer and fellowship. It's, you know, reading scripture um, sermons about the word of God, communion, confession and repentance. Yeah. Confession, repentance, testimony, all these things that are normal works of the Holy spirit that we're all familiar with. They're just accelerated. They're happening. What, what the way Dr. Seaman said is what God maybe would normally do in a year. He's been doing in a day. Um, and everything at, my personal experience is that ministry has never been easier. There's just, you know, because of the presence of God, I, I guess, um, people are so tuned in to how he's speaking to them. And so when I start praying for someone, um, they're aware of God speaking to them through the prayer. Same when I'm receiving prayer or when I'm just sitting there worshiping, I'm aware and able to engage with God. One of my friends said, you know, typically when I start worshiping on Sunday, it takes me a few songs just to 
clear my mind of all the distractions from work and all the stress in my life before I really feel like I can enter into worship. And he said, but as soon as I stepped into Hughes, it was like I didn't even think about anything else. And I was just drawn to worship God. Um, similarly, I had two friends come on Monday night and we probably spent two hours just talking through um, discipleship. You know, what does it look like to follow God and to surrender our lives to God, confess, remove the barriers of sin from our lives? These things that we always, that we often talk about in discipleship groups, and yet we were, they were so tuned in to what God was doing and wanted to do in them that we were able to cover two you phases know, of discipleship. <laughs> right. Yeah. In two right. hours. <laughs> Right. So um, I just know that for a lot of people that that haven't been able to be here and how I would have felt two weeks ago is just a confusion of like, it, it feels very surreal. You know, is this a real, what is this actually like? And so I wanted to say that, you know, it's these normal means of grace that God gives us but it's just infused with the presence and the Holy Spirit in a way that accelerates the work and uh, just magnifies the work. So I hope that's helpful for people. And as we close here, I was wondering if in either of you, but especially if, if Daniel, since you haven't been able to be here, if you had any questions um, about the whole thing. Um, hmm. You mean in terms of just like what is it like? I mean more like in to, in more detail than what you've just described. Yeah, just anything. I mean anything about the whole week and a half. One thing um, before we so much get to my question, I did kind of want to touch on what we were talking about before we started recording, which is we've been using pretty much most throughout this podcast we've been using uh, the term revival. Mm-hmm. But uh, it seems that a lot of people have a real reluctance or uh, <laughs> uh, take issue mm-hmm. with that word. And we, we all three obviously raised in the same um, family, in the same home. So our um, church background and tradition is going to be similar. And so for us, none of us really relate to, to this. Reluct- like people seem to have this feeling that that revival is a much more drastic and weighty term than, Mm -hmm. than we feel. Um, and we, we were kind of talking about that before. So there have been people, you know, saying let's, let's hold off judgment. Let's see, Mm -hmm. you know, if the fruit bears out 10 years away, then we'll know it's a revival. Mm -hmm. Um, so for now they want to call it like a, uh, what renewal outpouring outpouring or an awakening. Yeah. Um, so I just thought I just thought I'd mention that we're aware of that since we have been pretty freely using mm-hmm. various terms, yeah. including revival. Yeah, That's we're right. aware. Um, we just disagree. <laughs> yeah, I don't I even mean, know if I like... I don't even know if I necessarily disagree. To be honest, I just haven't studied um, exactly like the way people are using the term revival. So I, I'm sure if it's your field. You know, that like words really matter once you get deep into a specific area of study. Um, But to be honest, I'm just not that deep in whatever particular, I don't know if it's anthropology or what, but whatever field has been using this term to describe more of like a cultural shift, um, I'm just not aware of that. And so to me, revival has always been more just something that's dead coming to life. And so that's more what we're seeing in, in individual hearts and in the community at Asbury is just, you know, dead kind of stale things coming back to life. Yeah, like how free are we to use the term renaissance? It's the same thing pretty much. So anyway, I just uh, wanted to bring that. Up. Yeah, and I would say even even from this point, we know that like this is going to be something that is in like, like it's historical. Like... Yeah. We've had a, two, you know, going on a week and a half long college worship service with thousands and thousands of people coming from all over the country to be a part of it. Like that's, yeah, that's historical. Mm-hmm. So if it has to be historical, then that's covered. But mm-hmm. I guess people are really looking for like the cultural effect. Yeah. 
That's right. Um, but also, I also think it's look, important for people to understand just the history here at Asbury. Because right. like I said, I, I just gave a talk on the 1970 Asbury Revival. Yeah. And so as soon as I heard on Wednesday, like, Chapel hasn't dismissed, and right. the first word that comes to mind is, oh, is it a revival? Um, just because that's the history we've been in. Yep. Um, I also would mention... Uh, my sermon on last Sunday was largely about um, confession. Yeah, people, like, people should go listen to it if they haven't on the Harvest website. It was a really good sermon. Oh, thank you. Um, I felt the Lord definitely like directing what mm. the message was on. So this is what's been on, on my heart uh, because of that. Um, but two main things I would mention is I talked about things that are often private in our in our faith becoming a public thing. Mm. So um, That's good. The and I think that's what's been happening a lot, a lot in this move, this revival, um, mm-hmm. has been public things becoming public. That's and right. while Paul mentioned it's all like normal things, I would say, in my opinion, the most important one that's become abnormal in the church is confession. Um, that we that most Christians don't practice confession. That's they right. only confess their sins to God, and they don't actually tell a brother or sister their sins. And I think that is something that's necessary Mm -hmm. to really see God move in a powerful way and for you to be humble. Mm -hmm. And so I talked on Sunday about the way that confession um, destroys our pride, basically, Mm -hmm. and it deals with sin, which are two of the main obstacles to God moving, sin and pride. And confession really deals with both of those. Um, And so I would just encourage encourage us all as we're continuing in the work of God that confession needs to become a normal part of our Christian life um, where we have brothers or sisters that we're confessing to on a regular basis. Mm. Yeah. One of the ways that I heard somebody sharing um, at some point during this is that, you know, the world hides their flaws and they, they lift up their strengths and we as Christians need to do the opposite. We need to be quick to talk about our faults and confess those with the body of Christ. And then we hide um, the ways we're really excelling um, in humility. So my other, I guess, question that I've really been having the whole time is um, at to what extent and at what point, like, hmm. so I knew people traveling to go there. Um, and when you've done something like that, it's a big step. It's a big commitment. I'm sure there's a psychological aspect where you feel like I better experience something, you know, like this better not just be like a nice worship service. Although you said one of your youth did kind of feel like that. Um, but like with the parents going up, with different people going up, I've always been curious is at what point or is, is everyone going to encounter something in a unique way or are there going are do you think there are a lot of people or like over time maybe it more and more will be this is a great worship service i'm you know hallelujah praise god but that's it you know um Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and and will are is are people if that is the case reluctant to like admit that because of the kind of um (laughs) The, the hype, I, I don't want to use that word. Cut this. We have to cut. Um, <laughs> but because of, you know, it's known what's going on. Sure. Like something unique is supposed to be happening. And especially for people who traveled. But mm-hmm. even just local people, um, I feel like surely there must yeah. be some reluctance to yeah, like, be it, like, oh, it was, it was a nice worship service. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's a good point. And I would say yes to all of that, pretty much. Um, this Let me get right back. Sorry, I need to go check on Andrew real quick. Baby Andrew. Okay, no worries. We need, we'll, we'll wrap up soon, I think. Um, one of the things that my professor shared on Wednesday is just that this isn't for everyone. And so I do think it's important that people are okay with just enjoying what God's doing, but not feeling the pressure to um, have some some special experience. Although I will say, I think most people God is encountering in 
some special way, even if it's just prompting them to pray for something that they haven't ever prayed for. I've heard multiple people say that, that they got in there and just felt like, oh, I need to pray for um, the people in my workplace that I've never really interceded for. Um, but I know of one older gentleman who went in and sat on the back row and just smiled and watched. And when he left, he said, you know, those weren't my worship songs that I love. That wasn't, you know, I'm older than most people in there. Um, it's not really the way that I would typically conduct a worship service. And I didn't really feel anything. But I'm so thankful to just see God working on the lives of so many young people specifically. Um, so that's what I would say. It's It's not for everyone. It doesn't have to be. You don't have to feel something dramatic. But at the same time, I don't want to minimize emotion. Um, I think that's really one of the things I've been hearing a lot is like, you don't want emotionalism. And we talk about that a lot. And that is true. But there's also an aspect that God made our emotions and God works through our emotions. So just because something's emotional doesn't mean it's bad. Um, now, if you're seeking the emotion, that's bad. But if you're genuinely seeking God and you feel emotional, um, that's how God created you. We're emotional mm -hmm. beings. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there were a lot of times. Yeah, I think there were a lot of times I was there where right. I would get tearied. Like, just like some <laughs> teary. thought, teary, yeah, some thought of like heaven or just like the beauty of all these people worshiping together or just some like at one point I thought of like grandma and grandpa Sigler being aware of what's going on and how much they must be rejoicing because they went to Asbury. And um, so like different things like that would just hit me and it would become emotional and it was like beautiful. But uh, it wasn't that wasn't the goal was to like experience these warm fuzzies. That's right. Yeah, I've also heard a bit of this, like, disdain for uh, any emotional expression. And it's not something that I that I don't relate to. Um, I, I very much have, have been there and, and, and understand, you know, that emotion can just be fluff and can be, like, much ado about nothing. But I also have been thinking that... Um, spiritual experiences often are hard to describe in human language. Yeah. And very, and I think it's very often emotional terminology is the most, the closest we can get mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. describing yeah. the, the spiritual experience. So, I think people may be too quick to judge. This is this is a, a general concept that came to my mind once when I was sharing my testimony, and someone commented that that uh, that I say I feel like too much, um, and saying you know you don't need to have this emotional base. And I was thinking like I don't think my testimony is is highly emotional at all. I don't think that was a big part of my experience, but I'm, I was using that term. I feel like to basically mean, um, uh, uh, it's a, a partially formed thought or it's not a concrete conviction or thought, but it's sort of a, a, a an inclination or a leaning. Mm -hmm. So I was using this terminology that was interpreted as an emotional right. appeal. Right. Um, and I think these kind of things can happen because the spiritual is so beyond Mm -hmm. the everyday human experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. And everybody wants to, it seems like everybody wants to chime in on like their thoughts on what the revival or a revival, a pure revival needs to look like. But yeah, if they had conducted it. Yeah, but um, I've been impressed with just how God is always doing new things. And he's always working in new ways, um, just like from Narnia, right? Like I never do the same thing twice. Um, and so I think we also, we've been talking about humility. I think we also, just as the church, need to have humility in the way that we talk about stuff like this, that 
we don't have to be the one who's watching out for and defending God and defending the church from, you know, from, you know, you need to be cautious about such and such. Like, there's a place for that if you're a pastor, but um, let's rejoice that people are experiencing and coming to know God. And uh, and we don't need everyone in the church to be a prophet. You know, there's a role of the prophet that speaks truth and brings correction. But I, especially on social media, it's like every Christian thinks that they have to do that. And we don't, you don't have to. So be free to not have to worry about that and just enjoy what God's doing and let the prophets be prophets. Um, final. <laughs> we have so much we want to I say. Another, <laughs> yeah. Well, I have, a, I have another kind of question that I think relates to a lot of what we've said, which I don't know if I've missed the boat already, but, um, you know, you, by this point it's blown up and, and obviously like it's getting, you know, beyond the capacity i'm sure yeah the way it's going now can't keep going yeah that's right. um just from like a you know human endurance and logistics level yeah but and and you mentioned before like god can stop it at any time he's the one conducting it and everything mm-hmm. um but what how can it stop at this point like <laughs> When you have people who are traveling cross country mm-hmm. or, you know, from great distances and lining up and standing in line for up to four or five hours. Yeah. If it ends, do you just say like, OK, sorry, you came, but it's over um, <laughs> or we're glad you came, but the revival's over. But, you know, mm-hmm. we'll pray for you anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, and then what social media starts spreading around that like, OK, it's over, you know, ha- have your own, mm-hmm. like, please be yeah. going to the other places where it spread. Because yeah. how does it end, I guess? I think, like, how can it end once it's blown up like this to this level? I think that's where like the stewardship element has had to come in. And the Asbury leadership has, I know, you know, personally. And I think, too, like my perspective on this, it's it's easy for me to not be critical because I know these people like this is my home. These are my friends. Um, it's it's easy to be it's easier to not be suspicious and critical when it's my community. But I think we, to answer your question, the leadership has been in prayer about what that looks like. How do we steward this thing? And they've actually at this point um Publish somewhat of a schedule for this coming week where Sunday night is going to be the last evening service for the general public and going into next week it's going to be in the evenings exclusively 25 and under so only for Gen Z and then at this point they're saying that Wednesday night will be the last service on Asbury's campus Um, Thursday is the collegiate day of prayer. So they are hosting that. Um, but it'll also be live stream. It's a little different. And that was planned before this revival broke out. That's right. Yeah. That was planned. Yeah. Well before. Which I was really surprised about why. Okay. never mind. We can talk about that later. (laughs) And then after that, they're encouraging people to go uh, to other sites that are going to continue to host worship services. Um, so I think that will act to diffuse it a little bit and just encourage people to invest in their own local communities and uh, continue to seek God with the same reverence and zeal we pray, but just in their local churches and areas. Mm-hmm. One of my friends um, posted on Facebook, uh, you know, is there, is there a point where the leadership dismisses the crowds like Jesus did? Um <laughs> And I think that's a good comparison if you're thinking about this sort of thing. Um, I'm, I would be hesitant as a leader to dismiss the crowds when they're coming, seeking God, unless I was very sure that that's what God was telling me to do. Um, but I just have, you know, I trust that the Lord's leading it. And if he wants it to go longer than Thursday, then he'll keep it going. Yeah, that's right. Um, and so but that's what I've been praying is just like, all right, is this where it's supposed to end? And um, the, are the crowds supposed to be dismissed at this point or does God want to keep it going? And if so, like, Lord, keep it going. Mm-hmm. And I, 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 like you said, Paul, I know the leadership also. And so I trust that they're seeking God and yep. that he's going to, he's going to lead them. Yeah. 
All right, I think and we so need far, to wrap. They've handled it as yeah, we need to wrap up. Any final thoughts from either of you? We one, could talk about this thought. forever, but yeah, because <laughs> it's one so final good thought so is, fun. which is along these lines. Um, probably the strongest like reproach I feel like I've ever heard from God was on Monday when I was in there Monday morning. So like early on and somebody kind of like made some sort of shout or something that to me seemed very like distracting and not like, you know, it was taking attention off. And I had just had that thought of like, Oh, like that doesn't need to happen or whatever. And I just got a very strong like reproach from the Lord saying like, I'm leading this and you're not. And like, don't try to bring in your like church expertise and church leadership into how all this needs to run. Like, let me run this. Mm. And so I've just been trying to maintain that. Like, I was like, yes, sir. <laughs> you know, um, <laughs> been trying to maintain that attitude of like, this is not mine to lead because God is leading it. Mm. Yeah. That's good. I think that goes along with one of the things that for me is possibly going to be the biggest takeaway in affecting my life and ministry moving forward is just a new dependence and awareness on God to lead. Um, you know, I was in there one morning very early and the people that were doing music went, went on to bed. And so there was no one on stage and the lights were on. It was just, I was in the room and there were probably 20 to 30 people in there praying and the worship continued and it became so aware to me that yes god uses us <clears throat> he uses our music he uses our speaking but when he's present and when he's leading then the worship can continue with nothing but his leadership and guidance and his working on our hearts and so often I've had the, the idea that everything has to be just right in a service to facilitate response. We have to have the pad playing to kind of create that mood that people can respond to the altar call. And yet, again, like God, Dim the lights. God uses our excellence and, and God uses our desire to do things well and to not be distracting. But it ultimately, when he's present... Um, he's going to accomplish his purposes and, and, and interceding and seeking his presence and his leadership, I think is going to be my main task in ministry going forward. And the thing that I will always be longing for after seeing what I've done, what, after seeing what he's been doing here in this way. Amen. Well, thank you all for listening to our unedited <laughs> thoughts on this unique revival awakening outpouring move of god that's happening at asbury i think i want to leave the audience with what joel said earlier about an encouragement to practice confession if you're listening to this and you don't have a group a small group of friends who you can talk about anything and everything and who you can specifically confess your sins to, I really just want to encourage you to pray for those people. Um, pray for God to bring the right people into your life and to seek a group of maybe three or four people that you can start to confess your sins to because the word, I believe it's Isaiah 59, talks about our sin being a barrier between us and God. And so if you have unconfessed, unrepentant sin in your life, um, that's going to be the first step to really being able to experience God in a deeper way like we've been talking about uh, in this conversation. So want to leave you with that. Again, thanks for listening to this unique uh, recording for us. <laughs> Usually I spend quite a while on the edit. But yeah, God bless you wherever you are. And we just pray that you would experience him more and more. You would have a desire for holiness and that there would be unity in the body of Christ in your area. God bless.